Hey YouTube, Kerry Rogers with Packabomb.com here talking to just you, the YouTubers. You may not be on my email list or check out my site, so I want to let you guys know about the Packabomb course that I have just released. It is called Packabomb Fundamentals, and what it covers is all of the things that I never really talk about in my videos. So how do you actually get the data that you want? Uh, you can't just take a huge gigabytes of data and zoom in and look at the things that you need to look at a lot of times. How, how do you do that? How do you uh, capture the data in the network? How do you know down the problem? How do you set up Wireshark? So for instance, you know, if you get into a car, you don't just hop in and drive like this because you might die. So same thing with Wireshark. Uh, you know, you need to set it up optimally so that you can increase your chances of actually finding the problem. So this is the third in a series of a little preview videos that I've put out, and this is actually an entire lesson, around 14 or 15 minutes of how to set up Wireshark properly of the uh, Packet Bomb Fundamentals course. So click the link if you want to uh, know more about the course, check out the other couple of videos I released about this course, and I hope to see you inside. All right, unit two, Wireshark setup. So we're pretty much done with slides. We're gonna do a quick topic uh, cover for this, this part. And then we're going to be into Wireshark the rest of the time. So we're going to first talk about Wireshark configuration. The things that I do if I've got a fresh install of Wireshark, uh, the things, how I set it up, things I turn on and turn off to set me up uh, to get rolling with Wireshark. And then we'll talk about profiles, how you can create different profiles for different kinds of troubleshooting and how to load profiles. You can download my profile if you want. I'll show you how to load it. And then we'll talk about display filters and coloring. So you know the, the, the display filters that I use the most, that I find useful, and the coloring that I, uh, you know, some of the defaults that I turn off, and then a couple that I add. So with that, let's get into Wireshark configuration. So this is a default install of 1.12.7 of Wireshark. This is the startup screen. You can start a capture. I'm just going to go ahead and load a PCAP that I've got here. So this is the uh, how it looks by default. So the first thing I'm going to do is go to Preferences. So we can go to Edit Preferences, or on the toolbar you can click the little, the little tool. Looks like a wrench and a something. And I'm just going to take you through, honestly, there's not a lot that I change from the defaults. So I'm going to do layout. Um, I like the second one here. Uh, the reason is because the packet detail pane is where I spend, you know, a, a fair amount of time. That's this pane here. And the packet bytes, whereas I want them sometimes, otherwise I want them out of the way. I want as much vertical real estate as I can get for packet details. So I choose this one and then slide the bytes out of the way. Columns, we're going to spend uh, a good bit of time talking about columns uh, after we complete configuration. For capture, if I'm doing capture in Wireshark, which honestly I don't do that much, I'll usually use a command line capture, but sometimes, sure, I use Wireshark. And if I do, I want all the resources for the machine in Wireshark dedicated to capturing packets, not updating my display, and those kinds of things. So I'm going to disable update list of packets in real time, and I'm going to disable automatic scrolling and live capture. Now let's go to name resolution. I am totally fine having a MAC address resolution on. I like to see this first few bytes, get the vendor information. So Cisco, Netgear, you know, Joe Bob, uh, <laughs> Nick cards. I, I, I like to see that. That's okay. I'm okay with that. I don't really want to see a service name. So I want to see 22, not SSH. I want to see 80, not HTTP. Uh, so I don't turn this on. And the same thing for IP addresses. I want to see IP addresses. I don't really want to see the host names. I don't want Wireshark having to do resolution in the background, going and resolving names and adding more work for itself. I'm fine with IP addresses. Now, one thing I do, if I'm looking at SNMP, I find OID resolution very helpful. So I will turn that on and then you can point Wireshark to the the folder on your hard drive where you have the MIB stored so it will translate those numeric OIDs to useful text. So lastly let's go to protocols and TCP since we're spending a lot of time with TCP. So validate TCP checksum. I, I leave this off and the reason is uh, if you recall when we talked about capturing on a host 
uh, many hosts will offload the checksum to the NIC card. So what that means is if I'm capturing on a host and that host is sending data, when Wireshark grabs the data, remember it grabs the data before it goes to the NIC card. So at that point, the checksum has not been calculated yet and it will be wrong and Wireshark will light up with all these black and red uh, <laughs> frames. Uh, now, if you're receiving data, it should be, it should, the checksum should be okay. However, I just like to have it off. If I'm troubleshooting an issue where it looks like the host is ignoring packets, like they're clearly being received, but it's not responding to them in any way, maybe they're getting dropped. And maybe I'll, I'll turn on checksum verification then. Allow sub to sector to reassemble TCP streams. This one, by default, I like it off. Sometimes I will flip it back and forth. But what this does is it takes the TCP stream and it will try to assemble it into a single uh, response. So if you think of something like HTTP, the first uh, you know segment back, the first packet back from the, the server has the HTTP headers, you know the HTTP okay, 200 OK. And then every subsequent packet is just you know the data coming in. So with this enabled, it will the HTTP subdissector will try to reassemble all those segments into a HTTP response, and the last one will have all the HTTP information, and every other one will just be. Let me see if it's up here. I don't see it here. It will just be um, you know like a TCP assembly thing. So I want to see the first packet back from the server and see the information that's in it. So I turn this off by, defa by default, but I will sometimes turn it back on. And my sequence numbers, yes. Relative sequence numbers, I like to leave this on as well. You know, sequence numbers are generally just a, a random 32-bit integer that's used. Um, with Wireshark, if you use relative sequence numbers, it will start with zero and then count up, you know, for every byte of data, the sequence number increases by one. So whatever the sequence number is, then that's the amount of data that's been sent. So that's useful. I also like to turn on calculate conversation timestamps. This is so, uh, like if you're looking at something like HTTP that has lots of TCP streams, um, you can get an idea of the delay between packets in the same stream when they're all intermingled. Um, so that's useful to have that on. And that's pretty much it for the configuration part of uh, Wireshark in terms of the preferences. So let's turn our attention to columns. Okay, so the default columns, um, you'll know, let's start over here with time. So the time here, if you go to view, time display format, the default is seconds as being of capture. And that's fine. I use that a lot. Um, you can do time of day, and remember the time of day is relative to your machine. So if this data, you know, if you're in California and this data was captured in New York, then in, 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 in the, in the user tells you, hey, we, we captured this data, it was at, you know, 10 o'clock, that's 7 o'clock your time in terms of looking at this data. So let's, let's put this back to um, seconds since beginning of capture. I like to uh, add a delta column so you can expand frame, go down to time delta since uh, from previous displayed frame, right click, apply as column. Remember that, right click, apply as column. That is your friend. You can do that for pretty much anything almost in the packet details, okay? So let's go and edit this, make it a little more succinct. Ooh, delta. And we're going to slide this over to here. Now, this is huge. You've got to have delta. I mean, if there's any, if we stopped right now, fine. You've got to have delta. This is telling you the time between the displayed packets. So you can see that this one showed up 600 milliseconds after this one. You can sort on delta and find you know, packets that took a long time to arrive. You've got to have this column. All right, so another thing I like to do is have, let's open up TCP. Let me click on a packet that's actually got some data, and I'm going to do uh, sequence number, apply as column. I'm going to do next sequence number, apply as column, and acknowledgement number, apply as column. And let's shorten these up a bit. 
go. Edit column details. Yep. Oh, okay. So why would I add this? When you're doing analysis in, let's say, throughput analysis, or you're looking at Wireshark and it's giving you all those red and black ones about uh, retransmissions or segment, previous segment not captured, out of order, how do you know if it's right? How, what does that mean? If you can follow the sequence numbers and the stream, then you'll know what's happening. So let's take this one, for example. This is sequence number one. So this is byte one. We're sending... 244, here, here's the link, the TCP link, 244 bytes. So the next sequence number would be 245. So you come to the next one, here it is, 245. And we're sending 1460 bytes. So that's the next sequence number would be 1705. And here it is. So you've got this nice little step ladder, stair step pattern when you're looking at these packets. You go, this is a sequence number, this is the next sequence number. And it lead, one leads to the other. Now, if you got here and it was 6085 and you come down to the next one, you know, again, making sure you're looking at data coming from the same host and it wasn't 6085, then something went wrong. If it's if it was 7545, then we missed a packet. And you would have this would be marked as previous uh, previous segment not captured. In addition, you have the ACK number, and the ACK is telling you, I have received data up to and including 6084, and I expect the next sequence number to be 6085. And, if, and there it is. So now you have the next sequence number, which leads into the ACK number, which leads into the sequence number of the next packet. So you've got this nice little pattern coming, th threading its way through these three columns that you can, you can follow along of the TCP stream. Okay? Great. Now, and I talked about, you know, you can see that this was uh, 244 bytes. So I like to also include the TCP length. Apply as column. And I don't think you really need, I'm going to move this over, I don't think you need both length and TCP length. To me, I tend to find TCP length more useful. Um, you, you, I didn't say youthful, did I? Useful. So I'm going to hide length. Not remove it, hide it. Protocol TCP, TCP, I don't ever, I mean, to me, this is just taking up space. I'm going to actually remove that. Now, if you hide something, you want to bring it back, go back to your preferences and click on columns and then see how it's unchecked. You can check it back and bring it back. Okay, so now let's talk about the window size. So the window size is an actual field in the TCP header. So if we bring this out, you can see it references an actual data in, in the header, and it's set to 256. That's not the actual window size, which represents the amount of space in the receive buffer. It's really 64K. Well, where did, it, where did that come from? That came from the send packet. The three-way handshake, there you always want to capture the beginning of a connection with the three-way handshake because there's the window scale option. This is only communicated in the three-way handshake, and that tells you what to multiply the window size value of to get the real window size. So I like to add the calculated window size as a column as well. And there we go. All right, so that tells you at a glance the amount of space in the receive buffer. So this is a lot of 60, 64K, which that's the sender, so who, who cares? What you really want to know is the receiver, and that's a little less. You come down, it's a little less. You come down, it's a little less, a little less. So that's, that's already an interesting pattern where we can see that the receive buffer is getting full or it's you know losing space. Okay, so we've got... Delta, we've got uh, our se sequence information, our TCP length, our window size. Let's add, if we click on another one, we expand sequence ACK analysis. Let's do bytes in flight. So bytes in flight is the amount of data that's been sent. 
and not yet acknowledged. So you'll see in the case of the server, we sent a 244 bit of data and then we sent a 1460 byte of data. If you add those together, it's 1704 and there's been no ACK. Here's the ACK, ACKing both of those packets and now we have zero bytes in flight and we start back over. So that builds up over time. As soon as there's an ACK, it is decremented. So that's useful to see you know, how much data is outstanding, how, much, uh, how many bytes are in the pipe, your BDP, the performance of the sender. Um, so I think that, you know, this is my pretty much standard default setup. Now I change it on the fly as I go. Um, you can download this profile uh, and, and put it on your, your Wireshark. I'll show you how to do that in the next video. And I'll show you how to create new profiles and tweak them for different scenarios.